Well, I am so excited for this series, which will be a couple weeks, because there's global intrigue with something out there right now with the Webb Telescope. And uh, in this series, we have some incredible experts that are gonna be on video with us. And um, I want you to know this series should enhance our faith and it should help build our relationship with God. And uh, you're wondering, what are we talking about? Let there be light and Webb Telescope. Let me tell you where it started. On December 25th, of last year, of 2021, so December 25th to 2021, uh, they launched the Webb Telescope. Who's they? NASA launched the Webb Telescope to go out into the world. And this is something they had been working on for over 25 years. And I'm fascinated by this. It has been launched into orbit and it is a million miles away from Earth in orbit right now, a million miles around Earth. And I believe we have some pictures of it. It cost over $10 billion. And if an asteroid hits it, uh, which one did this week, as they're just getting ready to have pictures, if an asteroid hits it that's too big, it's gonna destroy this thing, all right? So it hit it and it's fine, but in one asteroid and the whole thing could be over, all right? But this thing, it has a sun shield the size of a tennis court, okay, that is shielding it from the sun. And then it has a 21-foot mirror with 18 hexagonal uh, segments in it. And they think this thing is going to last 10 to 20 years, somewhere in the 10 to 20 years. And it's going to send back images. It's such a powerful telescope, it's going to go back like 100 times more powerful than the Hubble telescope, all right? And with this, they've been saying they're going to be able to look back in time. And that sounds crazy, but they're saying we're going to be able to look back in time. And then they're also trying to figure out with this telescope, is there an exoplanet that is uh, habitable for intelligent life? And so next week, we're going to talk about is there life anywhere else? All right. And so that's, they're, they're looking for it. And then these images are going to be coming back. Now, some people are going to use this discovery uh, and this uh, telescope to attack the Christian faith but I want you to understand, we should not be threatened by this, okay? The upcoming discoveries that are gonna be coming in, I mean, this is gonna just reaffirm what we believe about God and what we believe about creation, and it's gonna affirm uh, these things, and we should not be worried about this. As we get started, I want you to listen to what the Bible says about creation. In Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The psalmist reiterates this. And in Psalm 89, verse 11, he says, The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. And then God emphatically states it again in Isaiah 48, verses 12 through 13. Listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summon them, they all stand up together. That's our God speaking. This is the God we serve. So with this in mind, I want us to go and lean into this video now with our experts and then I'll be back to teach some more. I'm so excited today because I have guests with me and I wanna introduce them right away. We have, of course, Rich Hammer and then, of course, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. And so I just want you to do this. Even though I could say what you do, I want you to say what you do so that the people watching now can know why I'm so excited that you're with us. So, Rich, if you could start, I, I know you're uh, an attorney, uh, a diesel mechanic. Give me a couple other things that- CPA. CPA. Parliamentarian. Yes. Private investigator. Private investigator. I, I didn't know that one until today. And a fifth grade Sunday school teacher. Love it, love it. Also went to Harvard and... Taught at Cambridge University. Uh, see, already I'm in awe of you. And so now let's go to Dr. Uh, Jennifer Weissman. Sure. So I actually grew up on a farm in rural Arkansas. So my introduction to science was actually being interested in nature, in the night sky. We had a dark sky, so I enjoyed basically being able to walk out at night and look up and imagine what it might be like to be able to explore up there. I didn't know how to become a scientist at that point, right. but 
I went on to uh, university, studied physics at MIT, and then astronomy and astrophysics at Harvard for my graduate degree. And since then, I've had the privilege of working with the radio telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, other telescopes on, in space and on the ground. So I've had a little smattering of experience in a lot of science-related fields. Now, you both are people of deep faith. Can you just briefly share how you got a faith in Christ? Well, I was an atheist when I was in college, but then I met this woman, a fellow student, who was the most beautiful student I'd ever seen in my life and the most talented, the most gracious, most awesome, the most unimprovable. And uh, we started dating. She's sitting right over here. You need to meet this person, okay. <laughs> and uh, she started taking me to church. She, she was a, a very young convert herself, and she just had the joy of the Lord. And I was in a very derelict fraternity, and I didn't want to be seen going into this ramshackle church. Down, and, uh, but I, I did. I went into that church, and I, I saw a Christian community for the first time in my life, dynamic, loving, joyful, had everything that everybody on the face of this planet is seeking. And over the course of weeks and a few months, I prayed for salvation and uh, God transformed my life that day. Praise and God. It's, I've never been the same since. Dr. Wiseman, you had a different experience. You were raised in the church. Yeah, so I grew up in a, in a Christian family and we were active in our local church. And so I learned the principles of the faith from childhood and there was a time during my adolescence when I realized that I needed to either be living for myself uh, as my goal in life or living for Christ and say, okay, God, you know, my life is yours. I need you and your forgiveness and a life of, of walking with you. We're here today because I was reading about the Webb Telescope and images coming back in June and I was fascinated about the Webb and, and I know that, uh, Rich, you have a telescope too. I've owned probably 20 telescopes. I had no interest in astronomy growing up, but my brother did and he, he got a telescope for his birthday one year and he kept pestering me to come out and he'd found something he wanted me to see and I had no interest. But one night he was so persistent that I joined him out in the backyard you know, fumbling my way through the dark, went to his little telescope, probably a four inch reflector, and I looked through the eyepiece, and there, to my amazement, was Saturn. I could see the ring around, it was small, but I could see the ring around Saturn. This was not in a book or on television, right. this was reality, and it just ignited a passion in me for astronomy. So I started getting more, more telescopes. More expensive uh, telescopes. More expensive telescopes. Oh, my word, I'll tell you. <laughs> it, it, it culminated in a half-meter Ritchie Cretan telescope. The problem with that telescope, it was hampered by light pollution in my driveway. You know, we're a suburban location. Right. And it was uh, very difficult to take pictures. You know, you'd have these sky glow in the background. And I, I wasn't using the telescope for, all, for what it was worth. So I finally made the decision. Uh, to move it to a mountain, and <laughs> move it to a mountain in New Mexico, where it sits to this day. This is three or four years ago now, and there it is in this pristine environment, 7,500 feet elevation, far from any city lights. This night sky is just indescribable, and I can take a picture there in, in a second, and I can see detail in the spiral arms of a galaxy 100 million light years away. Dr. Weissman, I know that you've had an opportunity to work on Hubble. Give us any insight on Webb right now, how much better or deeper it's going to see and things like that. We as astronomers, we use different kinds of telescopes, like different kinds of tools. Most of my work and my own research has been with radio telescopes, which are these big dish-shaped telescopes you may have seen. Uh, I've worked with a whole array of them out in New Mexico um, for no my own research. Um, they receive a certain type of light, radiation, radio waves, which for astronomers, that's a type of light uh, because we see it all as part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Other telescopes that you may be more familiar with see visible light. That's, you know, the colors of the rainbow. And there's a lot you can learn you, looking at visible light. But there's also a lot you can learn by looking out in deep space with telescopes that see light that's outside of that 
rainbow spectrum, which is pretty narrow part of the broader electromagnetic spectrum. So the Webb telescope um, is going to see, or is seeing already, um, infrared light that's redder than red. Right. Webb is a, a very sensitive telescope. It's got a wide collecting area. Astronomers often talk about the aperture. That's kind of the bucket for how much, you, how much radiation you can receive. And uh, the Webb telescope has a pretty big bucket, a six and a half meter diameter uh, uh, mirror. And then it is also very cold. The Webb telescope has been put very far away from the Earth, over a million, a million miles. miles. Because the astronomers using that telescope really want to pick up the, some of the faintest infrared signals, and that can get uh, um, overblown by any kind of heat radiation that might be picked up from the Earth. Wow, and it's supposed to be a hundred times clearer than Hubble. Is that about right? Or? Well, it will be about that times more sensitive. That's okay. true. Um, this particular telescope mm -hmm. is going to help us see farther and farther back in time. And what I love about astronomy, one of the many things, is that it is like a time machine. Because as anything you look at in space, you're seeing it not as it is right this instant, but as it was when the light began its track to our telescope. And right, and that's still mind-boggling for yeah. people, that it's literally looking back in time. Well, we're seeing things as they were, because it's taken time for the light to get to right. us. And light travels fast, but not infinitely fast. It travels at the speed of light. And so when, you know, the sunshine coming to us, don't look at the sun, but if you did look at the sun, um, it would be the sun eight minutes ago, not the sun right now, because it's taken time for that sunlight to get to us. And that's the nearest star, uh, you know, to us is our sun, of course. The nearest other star is, or star system is the Alpha Centauri system, which is four light years away, so it's, we're basically seeing it as it was four years ago. So you can keep moving out in this way. The nearest big spiral galaxy full of billions of stars, like our own Milky Way galaxy, that nearest big spiral galaxy to us is Andromeda, and that's about two million light years away. And with powerful telescopes like the Hubble and other telescopes, we're seeing many galaxies millions or even billions of light years away. So the new Webb telescope will see even farther back in, in, in space and time, and that will show us these very infant galaxies. When I saw this about the Webb telescope, I immediately as a pastor thought, some people are gonna be threatened by this and think like, oh no, like it's saying we're gonna look back into time and mm -hmm. look back and which still blows my mind that, that we're gonna look back in time with a telescope. Yep. And I thought some people will immediately say, aha, see this proves no God. What is this gonna to do to their faith or what, do you, what does it do to your faith? Well, as a student of astronomy now for many, many years, I, it is only, enrich my faith, my study of science. The deeper I go, the better understanding, the deeper understanding I have of, of the laws of physics, the laws of nature. Uh, so I, I would say you really have nothing to fear. That's not my experience uh, that, that it's, it's, it's caused me to question anything. It's been affirming and it, it's, been, it's enriched my faith in ways I couldn't even imagine. I understood from an early age that God hasn't told us all the details about the creation in Scripture alone. He's given us the principles that we need to know, and one of those main principles is that God is responsible for everything. I love that. And like, in the beginning, God, and it's like, and I did it. Yes. And he was telling us, guess what? I did it. Yeah. You don't have to worship the sun or the stars or the moon or the mountain. Worship the one who made it all. Exactly. I love that about creation. Yeah, yeah. Science answer certain types of questions. Science right. is a really good tool for answering questions like, how does this physical force work? Or what's the composition of this? Or even what's the age of that? It's not the right tool for asking these bigger questions of, you know, is there a God? Does God answer prayer? How should I live my life? And most scientists realize that because if you try to make science answer some of these bigger types of questions, it's not the right tool. Likewise, if you try to make the, the wonderful gifts God has given us of, of, of scripture and other types of gifts to become science tools, 
that's not very effective either because you might right. be using the wrong tool to answer a kind of question that needs a different kind of tool. I've not been threatened by that. Like when I was young, it was the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. And I still, that's in my mind. And then I got older and I started to understand what the Bible was saying. And I understood the language that it was written in. I understood the meaning of words. And I started getting theological terms that were bigger, that as a pastor, I try to make simple for people. And I think the same thing in studying the, the universe, studying the galaxies, like God's getting bigger to me than smaller. Mm. And it's not eliminating my thought of God, it's increasing my awe of God and then the fact that God would love me enough to send his son Jesus to this earth to live a perfect life, to die in my place for my sins and forgive me in awe. The stars, he says, I know the stars, he calls on my name. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, that's, that's a mind-blowing thought because there are so many stars, we don't even have the numerical system really to, 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 to capture all. it because there are stars that are beyond what we would call the observable universe. So we don't even know how many galaxies and stars there are out there. But in the observable universe, there are hundreds of billions of galaxies and a galaxy can contain hundreds of billions of stars. So, you know, do the multiplication and you get a number that's, you've got to use scientific notation to, to understand. Sure. In this, you know, poetic language in scripture where, where God is, taught, is, is described as, as knowing every star, that's incredible, right? When you think about uh, that there's nothing that's, that's out of God's purview. So that's one of the messages that I take from scripture is that, there's no surprises to God. We're the ones that are being given the privilege bit by bit to learn a little bit more and a little bit more. You know, even a hundred years ago, uh, we didn't know that there were other galaxies outside our own Milky Way. Sometimes I wonder, well, didn't God want the, the generations past to know that there were all these, you know, if I had created a hundred billion galaxies, I would want everyone to know, but... If I fix the door handle, I yeah, want everyone exactly. to know, I, I fixed that, I did that, I, I just fixed it right there. That we seem to be being given the privilege bit by bit to learn a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more about what's yeah. in the creation, both in the big scale and also in the small scale. Well, I think about when people say like, does God even know I'm here? He knows billions upon billions upon billions upon, I mean, I can't even, trillions of stars by name. Of course he knows you. Of course he cares for you. Like you should be in awe and start every prayer with like, God, this is incredible that you know me, yeah. that you love me, and I get the privilege of talking to you right now. It should be in awe. I was looking at the Virgo galaxy cluster, of which there are 50 or 60 galaxies, and I had a big two inch wide angle eyepiece, which gave what they call a spacewalk phenomenon. It's, it's amazing if you've never seen that before. And so I'm looking at this through the big eyepiece at the Virgo cluster. I counted 20 to 25 galaxies, most of them spiral. And it just, I, I was overwhelmed by it. You know, I'm, I, this is not a picture. I, I'm looking at these galaxies as they were 50 or 60 million years ago. I've never seen anything in my own experience that compared to the majesty and the grandeur of that. Like Dr. Weissman said, each of those galaxies I'm looking at had maybe 100 plus billion stars. And so I'm looking at trillions of, of stars here, individual stars. What Grand Canyons are out there? What, what Niagara Falls are there that we're never gonna see? What, what do they have so far superior to what we've got? Uh, that, that's the challenge of science. This is something that we should be excited about. Yeah. This is something we should be, this discovery, this uh, new understanding of what God's created and the fact that he would love us so much that he would offer forgiveness. And I wanna close on that thought with that, that God is offering forgiveness to everyone. He wants to be in a personal relationship with people. He wants to, uh, forgive them of their sins because of what Jesus Christ did. And I would encourage people to look into this, to get to know this God, and maybe even say yes today. And I just love that as we discover more about this universe, these galaxies, that it shows us a God that loves us so much. And I love 
that that's the God we serve. Yes. Yeah. I am so grateful for those experts, uh, Richard Hammer with all of his pictures of space, and of course, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. She has worked on NASA's Hubble telescope, and she agreed to uh, do this with us, so brilliant they'll be with us on video for each of the next coming weeks. And uh, I'm excited for the, the images that will be coming back from Webb because I believe the tide will turn and I believe this is gonna give the church an opportunity for more evangelism. That's what I believe. I believe it'll give us an opportunity for us to say there is a God, there is someone that created this and people will go from atheism to theism and we can move them one step closer to meeting the God that we know and serve that has forgiven us of our sins. So I am excited for this. And I wanna say this, that we love both tools, both Bible and science. Um, it's not an either or, it's a both and. And the scientific world doesn't like to admit this, but there's a common bond between science and um, believing in God, and that is that you have to have faith. They don't like to admit it, but you have to, like in the story of creation, like scientists have to have faith that there's something before we know what was there, the unexplained first cause. Now, as a Christian, we would believe and say, God, in the beginning, God spoke and bang, it happened. How many know what I'm talking about? So that's what we would say. And so I want you to understand as we dig in this, I'm gonna hit a couple points of creation here. And there are many possibilities that people um, use to explain the how of creation. We have the Bible account of this, but people are like looking at this, saying, but how did this happen? Was it a literal six days? Was it God, what, did the earth start in an age state? Um, is this a historic account? Is this just a literary framework? Is it a young earth? Is it intelligent design? Is there a gap theory? Do you understand? There's all these things that people are talking about and trying to figure out about this. And when we look at the Bible, I want you to understand there's, e there's so much more to creation than even just what the Bible shows us. Okay, here's what I mean by that. What do I mean by that? The writer of, generous, of, the, the writer of Genesis um, uses the number seven a lot. And I'll show you this. Just in the first chapter of Genesis, the, the writer of Genesis says, you know, there's seven days, right? There's seven days. And interesting, on day seven, there's no end to day seven. If you look at the creation account, there's a beginning and an end, beginning and an end. Day seven doesn't have an end. Hold that thought, hold that thought. There's seven Hebrew words used in the first verse. In the second verse, there's uh, two times seven Hebrew words in the second verse of Genesis chapter one, verse two. Um, the statement about the seventh day in Genesis chapter one has three lines of seven Hebrew words. Can you see like the writer of Genesis, like seven, 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 trying to give us something like there's something going on here that God is communicating to us in Genesis chapter one, even more than just the things we're looking at right there. So we've got to pay attention. So what are the important things that Genesis is trying to show us the creation account is trying to show us. And the first thing is this. The Bible is telling us that God is the creator of everything. Okay, I don't, I, whatever theory you're believing in, like how, did they, like how did this happen? Like we see who did it, but how did it happen? I think this, I think this. I've been asking people like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? I asked my mom, she goes, I don't think about it a lot. I was like, that's probably a lot of people, all right? You know, but there's a lot, like how did it? So. The Bible does declare this though, God is the creator of everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're trying to figure out how and when and millions or billions or 6,000, we're trying to figure this out, but God says, God did it. He did it. And I wanna explain this to you. If you've ever done a remodeling project around a home, you're like, I wanna move that wall and your, your contractor will say like, no, no, you can't move that wall. Why not? That's a weight-bearing wall. What does that mean? If you move that wall, the house falls down. You're like, well, then don't move that one. That was a bad idea. Don't move that. What about this one? You know, a not weight-bearing. We can move that wall. We can actually get rid of that wall. We can move it back five. We can do whatever you want with that wall. But this is a weight-bearing wall. Can I tell you this? 
When it comes to the account of creation, if you're, again, I'm not gonna fight with you over which one of those options you're gonna pick, but I'm gonna tell you what, this is a weight-bearing wall. God created it all. Every, that's a weight-bearing wall. That's what he says. He, and, 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 and on top of that, um, people said like, well, what do, you, what do you think? Like of all those possibilities that you just mentioned, what do you, like, how do you, how do you think it happened and, and, and when and, and how did it all come about? And I came up with a new theory. My theory of the how and the when is I'm gonna call it the bit by bit theory. Dr. Wiseman said that. She said bit by bit we, under, we un, you know, understand more of it. And I'm like, bit by bit, it's a, a non-weight bearing wall. And I'm moving that not, ba- you know what I'm saying? But the weight bearing wall is God created it. I'm not moving that. Here's another weight bearing wall, all right? God created it out of nothing. That's a weight, like he created everything we see out of nothing. And everything the Webb telescope goes back and sees in time was created out of nothing. That's what the word of God says. Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. What a God we serve. He made it all and he made it all out of nothing. He spoke it in to be. Another thing that's another like weight bearing wall is this. Creation is purposeful. It's not random. It's not random chance. There's a purpose behind everything that we see, everything that God has created. There's a purpose behind it. Isaiah 45, 18 says, for this is what the Lord says, who created the heavens. He is God, who, he who fashioned and made the earth. He founded it. He did not create it to be empty or vain, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Everything that is created was created for a purpose. Now catch this, and has a function. It has a purpose and a function, everything. And we're told be fruitful, be multiply. Where things are, are, they have a function to grow. Everything has a function, the sun, the moon, the water, the soil, the, the plants, the animals, and mankind. It's a way, like we were created with a function and a purpose, which gets me to the thing I've been waiting to get to, which I had you hold on the verse, you know, day seven, no end to it. This is another thing that is a weight bearing thing. We are created for relationship with God. So he's like, I made it, worship me. I made it out of nothing. It wasn't by chance. There's a purpose for everything you see and you were created for relationship with God. That's like a weight bearing wall that it seems like society has like knocked that one out. Like, we don't need God. We don't need, we weren't made in his image where there's no purpose. It's random. And they're knocking these walls down. And then we wonder why people are depressed. And then we wonder why people are empty and why they're angry and why they don't value life. And well, because they've been knocking down these walls that are weight bearing walls. And going back to this one on, on day seven, having no end. This is really to show us, and the Bible Project has a really great video on this, and this quote comes from then. Creation is showing us that it's designed to show us his purpose is to share creation with his images so they can rest and rule it with him forever. Like he's like, I created you on this earth for your purpose, and it's to be in relationship. And day seven, the Sabbath day, the rest, the being in relationship with God. God's like, do you understand? The purpose of all this is for you and I to be in relationship. You have a purpose and I wanna be your God and I want you to follow me. We're going to be in relationship. Man is created for relationship. This is our function and when we lose our function, we lose our meaning, we lose hope. I mean, he made it and we are made to be in right relationship with him. 
And the best thing that we could do is get back into right with it. Do you understand that when you lead someone to faith to Jesus Christ, you are actually leading them back to their function, what they were created for. That's why when we're on mission for God, you feel so excited. Like this, I'm doing this to bring people back into the function. I'm bringing them back into the relationship. That's why when we sacrifice financially, do these, we're like, we are doing this to bring people into right relationship. That's why when you say yes to Jesus, that's the greatest thing. All of heaven is rejoicing. It, you are created to be in relationship with God. And they're like, he's back. Welcome home. She's back. Welcome home in right relationship. And the Bible tells us that sin separated us from God. But God said, I love you so much. I'm sending my son Jesus to this earth to pay the price for your sins so we can be back in right relationship the way that I created you. What a creator, God, we have. What a creation that we get to be a part of. What a joy to be on mission for those of us that know. And for those that don't know, what an opportunity today to say, I wanna be, I, I get this. I never thought a telescope would get me to here. But I understand now. This is why God said I created it. This is why God gave, the, gave this account. This is why there's no end of the day seven because it's all about that relationship with God the Father. And you know if you're separated and you know if you're back on mission. And if you're on mission for God, get more excited that you're fulfilling your purpose. Get more excited that you're fulfilling it. And if you've not said yes to Jesus, I pray today you'd realize, I wanna be right with God. This is what I was created for. This is why I have that empty. I want to be filled. I want to be forgiven. I want to be in right relationship. So God, I pray right now that we would realize this. You created everything we see. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Lord, you did it. We will never vary from that weight-bearing wall. Out of nothing, you spoke it into existence. We won't vary from that. We have purpose. Everything you created has purpose. And God, forgive us for chasing after other things. And, and it's even like the darkness and the chaos comes into our life when we go chasing after everything else that doesn't matter, that doesn't bring joy, that doesn't bring fulfillment. And out of that darkness and chaos, God, you bring life, you bring hope. And I pray, God, that we'd restore that right relationship with you. And I pray for those that know you, we'd be more excited to be on mission for you. This is what we are created for. This is what we were created for. And God, I pray that we'd be excited for this opportunity to be on mission for you. And for those that don't know you, Lord, I pray today would be their day to say, I wanna be right with God. I wanna be right with the God that loves me so much that he made a way, even when we messed up, he made a way for me to be forgiven and be back in the right relationship. God, let there be light. Let there be light in people's lives, understanding that you have come to be the light of the world. God, thank you for that. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.